today begins our annual um, fervent week of prayer. Um, for those of you who maybe are new or, or um, are kind of new to the congregation here, uh, at the start of every year, we take a week where we just try to emphasize as a congregation as a, and as individuals uh, an intimacy of prayer um, that we take from this Sunday to next Sunday, and we set it aside, and we all just kind of press in a little bit further to um, engage in, a prayer, in, a, in our prayer life on kind of a new level, on a different level. Um, this includes a lot of different opportunities. Um, some of you may have seen that we had some devotions going out um, each day throughout this week that we invite you guys to watch the clip and read the devotions um, on the disciplines of, of the spiritual life. Um, we gather again here on Wednesdays. We'll set, have some time of prayer on Wednesday. We have a special prayer event Saturday night. Next week will be a special um, prayer service on Sunday morning, and then we'll have the gathering um, Sunday night. So throughout this week, we just want us to kind of press in and, and get a little bit deeper into the discipline of prayer as, as um, individuals and as the congregation. And we do this because the reality is, as Christians, we should be people of prayer. That that should be a part of our lives. But what I realize that as much as this should be a part of the nature of the Christian faith, I, I really am profoundly aware uh, of the fact that many of us struggle um, to even understand what prayer is or how prayer works. Um, and I really believe that that ambiguity um, inspires indifference. That for many of us, we kind of sit back and we go, I know I'm supposed to pray. I don't really get it. It's never really connected for me. And so for most of us, if we really looked at our lives, if we really looked at our weeks, if we really looked at the time we spend in prayer, it's probably pretty low. And as much as we might come to these times and go, yeah, I know I'm supposed to be a person who prays. If you look at your life, you'd realize you don't really pray. And I think part of the reason for that, as I say, is because many of us don't really understand prayer, don't really understand what it is and, and its very nature and how it really has an impact on our lives. Fortunately for us, I believe that Jesus brilliantly reveals to us the nature of prayer for the believer in the midst of his revelatory Sermon on the Mount. Um, when you go to the Sermon on the Mount, most of us are aware of a lot of different passages within it and, and are aware of the, the, the great depth of the Sermon on the Mount. But in that, Christ is um, creating a manual of sorts for believers. If you look at it and you follow through it, there's so many different topics that he hits. In, in, in the sermon, he, he teaches on, on the nature of, of mercy and mission. He teaches on, on marriage and sin. He expounds on charity and generosity and even anxiety. He admonishes people... Um, in faith, in forgiveness, in fidelity. And in the middle of all of this, he teaches us not only how to pray, but really in that, the nature of prayer. Pray then like this, he says. Our Father in heaven, hallowed be your name. Your kingdom come, your will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread and forgive us our debts as we also have forgiven our debtors. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. In the middle of this sermon, we get the Lord's Prayer. And what is really key for understanding Christ's teaching through the Lord's Prayer, and I, and, I, and I think it's really important for us to understand this, for many of us over generations upon generations upon generations upon generations, we've come to the Lord's Prayer and we've read it and we've recited it, but I think it's important for us to understand Jesus Christ was teaching us about prayer in that. It's not just about something that we recite, but it's about something we learn from. And for us to really learn the lesson that Jesus Christ is teaching, you really need to focus in on the introduction. How he introduces what he's saying. The words he uses. And what does he say? Pray then like this. 
The words he uses here are particularly important because his emphasis isn't on simply repeating these words. In fact, just prior to what we read, he says, do not pray in vain repetition like the heathens do. What he's saying is it's not about memorizing the words, but understanding the way to pray. What he's saying here is pray in this way, pray in this manner. This is how you come to prayer. This is the nature of someone who is a follower of Christ, the way we pray. And as we see his teaching, as he lays out for us the way in which we pray, what we begin to see deeply is the nature of prayer in the life of the believer. Alexander McLaren describes in his commentary on the Lord's Prayer, the depth of the expression of the truth that Jesus Christ is revealing in this when he writes, the words of Christ, like the words of God, are inexhaustible. Their depth is concealed beneath an apparent simplicity which the child and the savage can understand. But as we gaze upon them and try to fathom all their meaning, they open as the skies above us do when we look steadily into their blue chambers or as the sea at our feet does when we bend over to pierce its clear obscure. The poorest and weakest learns from them the lesson of divine love and a mighty helper. He's telling us the prayer opens before us a a revelation about God's interaction with his children through our prayer. Jesus Christ is teaching us something about who we are and who God is as we go to prayer, the very nature of our prayer life. The words of Christ in this prayer are meant to teach us the nature of our prayer and how that nature empowers, inspires, and transforms us when we pray in this way. And the starting point of that revelation about the nature of our prayer life is that it is really about God. The first thing that we really see in the words of Christ as he teaches us about prayer in the Lord's Prayer is that prayer works to properly align us spiritually. Prayer acknowledges God as Lord. Now think about this on just a very simple, straightforward way. Prayer acknowledges God as Lord. It says God is over. God is in control. God is God. Look again at the Lord's Prayer as Jesus Christ reveals to us and says, this is how you pray. Our Father in heaven, hallowed be your name. Your kingdom come, your will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread and forgive our debts as we have also forgiven our debtors and lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. When you hear these words, what is it saying? What is it acknowledging with every single line? God is over. God is above. God is God. Hallowed be your name. Father in heaven, you are holy. You are venerated. You are pure. You are set apart. Your kingdom come. Your will be done. The declaration is we are subjugating our will to the will of God. God, your will, not my will. Your will be done. Because you're God. Not what I want, but your will is the declaration. Give us this day our daily bread. It is the acknowledgement that God is provider, that it's not upon myself, it's not my responsibility, it is not my calling, but he is my provider. That I'm not the one that I rely upon. I don't rely upon my boss. I don't rely upon the person who writes my check. God is my provider. Give us, forgive us our debts 
The declaration there is, we have no place of spiritual arrogance before him. No, no right to demands, but that we are indebted to him. Every statement through this prayer is about God being the one. In fact, the last declaration here is, lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. It is the declaration, you are my salvation. You are the one who ultimately draws me near. You are the one that protects me from sin. You are my salvation and my hope. Every single line of this prayer rightly aligns ourselves spiritually before God. What we have to understand from that is that prayer itself has the power to rightfully, rightly align oneself under the lordship of God. The act of bowing your head and bending your knee is the very real posture of a subject before his king. I can't do this. I, I'm not in control. I am not my own salvation. I am not my own provider. I am sinner who needs your forgiveness and who needs to forgive others because of who I am before you. The truth is spiritual arrogance is a great threat to spiritual growth. But prayer, simply the act of prayer produces in us spiritual humility. This is one of the real problems when we, when we choose to neglect a prayer life. We become very self-reliant and very self-arrogant. But when we pray continually and constantly, we are acknowledging every time we go to prayer that we are subject to a king. The power of prayer is discovered in the act of prayer because it rightly subjugates, rightly acknowledges our subjugation to God. I, I want you to hear that and I want you to understand that the power of prayer is not that far out there. It's not too difficult to see. It's not too difficult to receive the benefits of. When we discipline ourselves to pray regularly, you will regularly be rightly aligning yourself before the throne of God. Just that. Think of just that. In your spirit, in your life, in your walk, isn't just that valuable? That every single day, I acknowledge who I am before the king. The other spiritual gift that prayer offers to your spiritual life is that prayer practically activates your faith. For many of us, we have to realize, we have to embrace the truth that the very act of prayer is an act of faith. When we think about this idea of faith, we see all throughout scripture, it says over and over again, without faith, it is impossible to please God. That faith is integral to our walk, to our life as Christians. And when we hear that over and over and over and over again, how many of you ever feel overwhelmed with the declaration that I have to live by faith? Because when you look at your life, you don't live by faith really well. And I say that not about you, I say that about myself. The call to live by faith is really hard. For many of us, it is a really difficult task. And as I say that, I'm being honest with you about my own life. I can't tell you how many times I find myself in turmoil. I find myself under stress. I find myself worried about finances, worried, worried about this situation and relationship, worried about this church and how we're going to make it. It's not one of those things where I kind of walk through my life always going, it's going to be okay. Everything's going to be fine. God's got it. That's where I want to live. That's how I want to live. But the truth is, faith itself, living by faith, is not an easy thing to do. But the very act of prayer itself is the practice of faith. Think for a moment about the definition of faith in Hebrews chapter 11. This is one I think a lot of us read and we really struggle with. We've heard it a lot. 
but we really struggle with grasping what it means and what it's saying. Now, faith is the assurance of things hoped for, the conviction of things not seen. Faith is the assurance of things hoped for, the conviction of things not seen. For many of us, we read this, and I think we trip up on understanding what he's saying here when it says the things hoped for. Because we think of it as this kind of idea that's a lot more ambiguous. It's like, man, I really hope this happens. It doesn't seem to be our understanding of what faith is. But as we've talked about this a few weeks ago, hope in Scripture as it's used in this context it is, is not the world's definition like, I hope this happens. I hope this happens. I hope so. Hope is defined in Scripture as, as a desire for some, some future good with the expectation that it's going to happen. When we talked about this a few weeks ago, I used this illustration, and I think it matches pretty well. There's this one idea that I hope I get something. It's like when my kids hope I bring them home chocolate cake. Oh man, I hope dad brings home cake this today. That's one way in which we tend to think of the idea of hope. But the scriptural idea of hope is, not, is in a different route, which is my children have put their hope in the fact that they know mom and dad will feed them. Now they hope it's chocolate cake. But they put their hope in the fact that they know that mom and dad will feed them. Scripture here is saying that that hope is the type of hope that we see here. That, that faith is the fact that we have the full expectation that the goodness of our father will meet us. That the love of our father will manifest itself. That we have a faith and that we put our hope in God. Hope then is confident expectancy. Hope is looking forward to something with the reason for confidence, expecting a complete fulfillment. So faith is the assurance of things hoped for and the conviction of things not seen. In other words, it's a reiteration of an idea in both ways. We have an expectation and we have a conviction that God is is going to move. Both of these phrases are the same. A reiteration. Faith is hopeful confidence and conviction, an expectation to receive, even if we don't see it now. When we go to prayer, we are evidencing that hope, that conviction, every single time. Do you know that people who don't believe in God don't pray to God? Right? People who don't think God will answer them, don't think God will do anything, don't think God has the power to do anything. The people who believe that God's hand is too short to reach into their moment, into their circumstances, don't waste their time praying. So the very act of prayer is evidencing that you are stepping out in faith. If you are sitting here and when you read those passages, it says, by faith it's impossible to please God. When you read those passages, that say, walk by faith. And you look at your life and you say, I don't think I measure up. I don't think I'm getting there. I don't think I'm living by faith the way I'm supposed to. Do you know what you can do to evidence faith? Pray. Start praying on a regular basis. Activate faith in your life by saying, God, I believe you will answer me. I believe you are there to hear me. Start to pray. When you look at the expectations of the Lord's prayer, you see faith at work. God, give us this day my daily bread. God, give us forgiveness. God, lead us, actively lead us not into temptation. Each of these shows a confident expectation of provision at the hands of the invisible God. Conviction of things not seen. It's really interesting because this, as the author of Hebrews wrote that, he was alluding to a, a Hebrew, Hebrew phrase 
that has always been about pointing to the one true God. See, they were, they were in this kind of saying, the people who worship idols, the people who worship graven images, they can see something. They look at something. But we have our faith in the unseen God. So our hope is in that which we do not see. That, that, that we have faith in him, not because we can touch him or see him, but because we know that he is true. Prayer, real prayer, not vain repetition, not obligated mumblings, but heart and head engaged prayer is the practice of faith. Guys, it is not that hard to be people of faith. We can pray. We can take the time every single day to bow our heads before the king. And we can make our requests before him. And every single time we do, we evidence that we have faith in him. And we're living in that place by faith. Without faith, it's impossible to please God. So pray. Be people of faith. And to this point, we have seen the very natural effect of our prayer lives that prayer offers. When we pray, we rightly align ourselves spiritually before God. When we pray, we activate our faith. Now, I want you to hear that. I want you to stop here before we go any further. And I want you to see the power of prayer just there. The power of prayer just there rightly aligns us spiritually and puts us where we're supposed to be. It teaches us spiritual humility. It allows us to be under God and to know God in deeper ways and to understand who we are with other people. Prayer does that practically. That, that prayer, when we, take, when we take the opportunity to pray, we're activating faith in our lives and we're living by faith just by praying. These are very natural, very, very, very simple expressions that are powerful in the life of the believer. But there's something else that we can't ignore. Prayer powerfully accesses the supernatural. I believe that prayer changes things by the work of God through his Holy Spirit. That God does the remarkable, that God does the supernatural, that God breaks into our lives and into our moments and does that which only he can do, that is beyond us, that he heals, that he saves, that he calls, that he disciples, that he delivers, that God breaks into our lives, that prayer brings about the supernatural work of God in us. Prayer is an act of faith that invites divine interaction and divine intervention. The interaction with God is revelatory. The, the, the interaction with God brings revelation. Now, that divine revelation, you have to understand, the, the, the general divine revelation of the Holy Spirit is closed. It, it, it's it's in, the, in the Bible. He revealed himself in very profound ways through the word of God. But there is, there is individual, personal, divine revelation that God does in our lives. And we see it in scripture over and over again. That, that he will, in prayer, we, he will, while we are seeking him, break into our lives and bring personal and specific revelation. He uses words of wisdom. He uses words of knowledge. He uses the prophetic. He uses visions. I mean, even in the Lord's Prayer here that we see, the Lord's Prayer says, lead us not into temptation. You understand that that declaration can't be about this just kind of a general idea, but it's about each one, you know, each of us individually we're praying, God, make sure that this temptation that doesn't befall me. Make sure that you protect me from that temptation. Because each one of us have different temptations, right? And so we're saying, God, lead me in ways for me, for my life, that I avoid temptation. 
We see examples of of Peter's revelation of Cornelius. We see Paul's praying and being prevented by the Holy Spirit from going to Asia. And then praying and being sent to Macedonia. We see in 1 Corinthians the instructions on the gifts that the Holy Spirit given for the edification to the body with words of wisdom, words of knowledge, prophecy, tongues, and interpretation. Each of these are revelations by the Holy Spirit as he's speaking into our lives as we seek him in prayer. Now, every revelation of the Holy Spirit must be in accord with the word of God. It must be tested as from the Holy Spirit. But God speaks to us even today. I can can recount for you story after story after story after story throughout the history of Mercy Hill Church where God has spoken as clearly as he possibly could. Have you ever been to one of our um, new friends' uh, dinners, one one of our welcome dinners at my house? I usually will sit and give kind of a little bit of a story and history of Mercy Hill Church, and, and one of the stories I tell all the time is about the first location we ever found ourselves in. How many of you guys remember us being in the Hyde House? The hardest part about planting a church I have always found is finding a place to be. I hate it with everything that's in me. It's the reason I will never plant another church as long as I live. Even if God tells me to, I won't do it. <laughs> hate looking for churches. Hate looking for buildings. And we, me, me and Pastor Kevin was out in Lake Country when we started the church. We went from place to place to place to place, looking and looking and looking and looking. And dead end after dead end after dead end. We went to a burger place, and as we were walking out, there was this sign, and there was this, this, there was this poster there that said that they, were, that, it, that they rented out a space for events. And so we're like, well, let's try one more place. Well, they'll say no. So we grabbed it. And it was to this multi-tenant space that was the Hyde House. It was an old tannery that was 100 years old, multi-tenant space uh, that was just trashed. It was a, it, it, and, the, and the setup of it was against all the rules I'd ever learned about a church building. Okay, First rule of, of, of a church building is accessibility. The second is visibility. Now, if you remember the Hyde House, it was neither accessible or visible. For years, we'd have people come in and say, this is the third Sunday I've tried to find you. (laughs) Honest to goodness, I usually would answer with, well, now we know you want to be here. The second second rule is um, parking. There was 30 parking spots, and the rest was in kind of a dead-end neighborhood with train tracks behind it. The, The third rule is you were never on the second floor. Well, where we were going to be was on the second floor. Uh, second floor, I only had an elevator that was a service elevator that um, at the time my dad was in a wheelchair. And every time I rolled him in there, I thought I was, you know, like, good luck, dad. <laughs> Hope you make it. You'd go to the second floor where we actually started the church and we met and there were, there were holes big enough in the children's room for small children to fall through. Broke every single rule, every single rule of being in a, of a church building that I'd ever learned. And I'll never forget the first time we walked in there. I stepped in, the doors opened, and as I walked across, I heard the Holy Spirit speak to me. I heard the voice of God like I'd never heard before. This is your new home. To the point where I started to cry. And it was like, well, it's not the right idea. It's not the right choice. It's not the right path but it's the voice of God. And I could tell you story after story after story after story of the, of the blessings of God for us being in that place at that time. The people that he opened the doors to for us to minister to, the things that he did because we were in that place. And it's because God still speaks. This is God speaking to us. This is the interaction that he has with us. This is him coming in and breaking into our life and speaking to us in all circumstances and situation. Devotion to prayer, communication with the Father through the Holy Spirit provides us the guidance, the supernatural guidance that comes from the Holy Spirit in our lives. As Andrew Murray said, prayer is not monologue, but dialogue. 
God's voice is its most essential part. Listening to God's voice is the secret of the assurance that he will listen to me. The reason why we pray is not just so that we can throw up, offer ideas to God, but that we sit and we listen to God speak to us. And in that, he steps in and leads us and guides us. And then ultimately, we see prayer bringing about supernatural transfer, transformative intervention from God. And what I mean by that is the type of intervention we generally think of when we talk about prayer. That he heals, that he provides, that he changes the circumstances, even in miraculous ways. This, this is the give us this day, our daily bread, part of the prayer. That we reach out to him and we say, I know you know my circumstances. And I'm asking you, God, to step in. I know you know that I'm hungry. I know you know that I'm cold. I know you know that I'm sick. And so I'm asking you, Lord, to manifest yourself in powerful ways to set me free, to provide for me, to heal me. And, and I want you to notice something, though, up until this point. I want you to notice something about what we've been talking about when it comes to prayer. Up until this point, we have been talking about the power of prayer to change without ever getting to this idea yet, right? That God changes us in profound ways before we ever get to this. You see, it's not just about the fact that we want healing. It's not just about the fact that we want deliverance. It's not just about the fact that we want more money in our bank account. But it is a part of it. God still intervenes in powerful ways. Prayer spiritually aligns us properly. Prayer activates our faith. Prayer fosters communication with God to lead us. All of these are powerful in our lives. So even before we get to divine intervention to change circumstances, prayer is essential. But prayer does change things. Look at what James 5 says. Is anyone among you sick? Let him call for the elders of the church and let them pray over him, anointing him with oil in the name of the Lord. And the prayer of faith will save the one who is sick and the Lord will raise him up. And if he has committed sins, he will be forgiven. Therefore, you confess your sins to one another and pray for one another that you may be healed. The prayer of a righteous person has great power as it is working. Elijah was a man with a nature like ours, and he prayed fervently that it might not rain. And for three years and six months, it did not rain on the earth. Then he prayed again, and heaven gave rain, and the earth bore its fruit. God moving in the unforeseen supernatural reality of our existence is available to us when we pray. Next week will be, a, will be a special prayer service. And in the midst of that prayer service, we'll be giving testimonies of the things that we've seen God do over the last year and in the lives of people where God has broken in, where God has healed people physically, where God has delivered people from, from, from oppression, where God has realigned people's hearts and their minds and set them free from depression. And God has made them whole because we have prayed and God broke in. Here's the reality. God is still on the move. God is still healing people. God is still delivering people. God is still doing things in people's lives. And when we stop, when we stop praying in our lives, we make the confession we don't believe God still moves. Every single time we bow our heads and we pray for healing, we are declaring we serve a healing God. Every single time we pray for deliverance, we are declaring that we serve a deliverance God. Every time we pray for God's provision, we are declaring that we serve a provider as God. Because God still moves. And God still heals. And God still delivers. The reason why we want to be a church that prays, the reason why we want to be Christian who pray is because we want to see God do 
the miraculous, to set people free, to show people that hope and life is found in Jesus. I think the great missionary Judson Taylor sums it up well when he said, the prayer power has never been tried to its full capacity. If we want to see mighty wonders of divine power and grace wrought in the place of weakness, failure, and disappointment, let us answer God's standing challenge. Call unto me, and I will answer thee, and show thee great and mighty things which thou knowest not. We do not see the hand of God move in our lives quite often because we do not take God up on that call. Call out to God. He is here to heal. He is here to deliver. He is here to set people free. He is here to provide for you in all of your needs because God still moves. This is why we emphasize in this week a week of prayer. Because I believe that Mercy Hill Church as a congregation and us as individuals need to prioritize this as a part of our lives. That this would be a catalyst. Not the end, but a catalyst for us to be a church that commits itself to prayer so that we can see God move in incredible ways. This is the call. This is the call. This is what I call you to this week. Can we be people of prayer so that our lives will be rightly aligned under the lordship of God, so that we can be active in our faith, saying, I believe that God moves, and that we can have the intervention and the interaction with God to change us, to transform people, to set them free. The burden that I have, sincerely and honestly, as we enter into a new season at Mercy Hill Church, is that there are so many people who are hurting. So many people who are bound in their lives by the works of Satan. So many people who are depressed and struggling in their lives that are not meant to be. Because the power of God can set people free. And the only way we're going to be instruments of that is if we become people of prayer. That's how God will meet us. That's how he will move.